Hi, my name's Deborah Fox and I'm the Senior Curator at Museums Worcestershire. I'm speaking to you today on behalf of the Society for Museum Archaeology and all of the information within this webinar can be found in the standards and guidance in the Care of Archaeological Collections produced earlier this year by SMA. Museum archaeology collections typically contain a diverse range of objects collected by antiquarians, field walkers, metal detectorists and the public making chance finds, but the vast majority of collections are derived from archaeological projects and of course archaeological archives are the result of those projects. Archaeological archives are compiled for accessioning into the permanent collection of a museum or repository to make the results of the project, its records and its finds accessible for future use. As such, once an archive is accessioned, it becomes part of the greater whole, the collection, which represents the results of studying the past of any given locality. Archaeological archiving is about preparing something that will enhance that resource. An archaeological archive comprises all the records and material objects or finds recovered during an archaeological project and identified for long-term preservation. This includes artefacts like pottery or metalwork, environmental remains like animal bone or seed remains, waste products like iron slag and scientific samples, but also the written and visual documentation of the project in paper, film and digital form. As the project progresses, the archive too will obviously develop. Initially, archaeologists will create a working project archive. This will comprise all the records and finds collected during excavation and data gathering and retained for subsequent analysis and reporting. The preserved archive comprises all the records and finds selected from that working project archive for final compilation and transfer to a museum or repository for curation in perpetuity. Selection, therefore, is really important in determining the contents of the preserved archive. And so an archaeological archive has two basic elements, a documentary archive and a finds archive. The documentary archive exists in both physical and digital forms and can include project planning documents like a project brief or a project design administrative or formal documents like licenses or transfer of title forms, selection strategies or data management plans. It can include textual records like a pro forma for data gathering or notebooks or databases and spreadsheets. And it can contain graphic and spatial material like photographs, drawings or CAD files. Digital material is part of the documentary archive and that might include either born digital data those that are originally created in digital form, like a photograph that's taken with a digital camera or maybe CAD files or GIS data. But it can also include digitised data that has been entered or scanned into a computer from an original analogue version, such as a handwritten context record or a drawing. Digital material shouldn't be collected for curation by anyone other than a trusted digital repository, something like the Archaeology Data Service. A museum or repository might collect copies of the digital material, but that will be purely for research purposes and a museum is unlikely ever to attain trusted digital repository status. As well as providing the long term stability of the digital archive, the trusted digital repository will prescribe preservation file formats. They'll ensure that the archive is findable by assigning a unique identifier to it. They'll provide a metadata framework so that it's findable and reusable and they'll ensure that data is accessible by using standardised communication protocols. The material archive includes all the material collected during excavation or data gathering. That could include bulk finds, which are inherently robust, uh, not recorded in any detail, and they very rarely have any kind of specific storage requirements. It might be pottery, brick or tile or animal bone. It could include registered finds which will be recorded as individual objects and they do often need to be stored in environmentally controlled conditions. Material like metals, worked bone or leather or textiles. It can contain material retrieved from samples and samplings and related to or identifiable by a sample number like mollusks, shells or seeds or micro finds. 
It can contain human remains which are required to be stored in very particular ways. Those are outlined, outlined by the DCMS in their guidance on the care of human remains in archaeological collections. And it can contain specimens or samples collected during analysis. They might result from laboratory work and they might be things like thin sections of pottery or stone. So archaeological projects should result in a stable, ordered and accessible archive that represents the results of the data gathering, analysis and interpretation of the site and should be compiled in accordance with the requirements of the museum or repository that will curate it in perpetuity. An archive must represent the results of the project and have the potential to inform future research and enable curatorial activities like exhibition, learning and public access. A variety of different organisations carry out archaeological projects and therefore create archaeological archives, but they should all be working towards the aim of producing a stable, ordered and accessible archive. So professional archaeological contractors do account for nearly all of the archaeological projects carried out in the UK, and they can range from large organisations with several offices to small localised outfits that carry out jobs within a limited geographical area. Across this spectrum, levels of archiving expertise are inconsistent, as is the frequency with which those archives are deposited. But if contractors often work in a particular area, they should become very familiar with museum or repository deposition standards and guidelines. Their projects will be embedded in that local planning system where archaeological work is required prior to development, and they'll be initiated by a development control archaeologist working on behalf of a planning authority. Universities will conduct research projects too. They should have produced a project design and that should indeed describe how the archive is to be compiled and curated. Some archives do remain within our academic departments for teaching purposes and so the need for communication with the museum or repository is not always acknowledged. And lastly, community groups produce archives, they rely on enthusiastic volunteers often who will not always have experience of all parts of the archaeological process, including archiving, and their focus can often be on field work and often they may well need support and assistance through the post field work and archiving stages of their projects. Communication should be continuous amongst the stakeholders, including museum or repository creators, through the course of the project life cycle through planning, data gathering, assessment and analysis, reporting and dissemination, archive compilation and archive transfer. And those stakeholders who need to be included in the decision making include development control archaeologists, collections curators, developer or landowner or, or perhaps their consultant and the project team, which potentially might include a project manager, post excavation manager, archives officer and find specialists. Some relationships will become really very well established over multiple projects, such as those between museum curators and development control archaeologists who are working in the same area, and they might foster um, a relationship on a wider basis than just project by project. But there will be projects where stakeholders are less familiar and an actual communication plan might be required. Communication as the project progresses will ensure that the interest of all the partners, including the museum or repository, are consistently represented and understood, especially in the in implementation of selection strategies. So an ideal communication plan might include a programme of regular reviews and updates between those stakeholders to ensure that personnel have knowledge of progress and also they know what finds have been recovered. The final project archive will be shaped through that consultation and decisions that are taken throughout the lifetime of the project will influence what the archive looks like. So they might be decisions like changing research aims of a project or a percentage of the site excavated. It might be selection and retention strategies or the extent to which material is assessed as part of a post excavation analysis. Communication is also vital during the final archive compilation so that the museum or repository personnel know the size of the archive and can programme in delivery and accessioning. A site-specific selection and retention strategy should be developed in consultation with all the project stakeholders. In 2019, the Chartered Institute for Archaeology and Historic England 
produced a toolkit for selecting archaeological archives to help ensure selection is focused on what should be retained in order to preserve the integrity of the archive that respects the outcome of the individual site in question, its research aims, the wider research aims, and of course the collection it will be joining. Curators require a shared licence to the copyright of the content of the documentary archive. Copyright resides with the creators of documents, but in order to enable future use, they should give the museum or repository a shared copyright licence to access and disseminate the archive for as long as it is in their care. The collecting institution must acquire ownership of the material archive. This secures the archive within the systems of governance of the museum or repository and allows them to access and utilise the archive for any purpose. Where appropriate, mainly outside Scotland, this is achieved with a transfer of title agreement between the museum and the owner of the material archive, which most often is the landowner at the time that the finds were collected, but can sometimes be the archaeological organisation. National standards and guidance documents relating to archaeological archives are mostly written to inform people who create archives rather than those who receive them. But they do establish what part stakeholders are expected to play in the process and what each should be expected to do. So examples might include Archaeological Archives, a guide to best practice in creation, compilation, transfer and curation, published by the Archaeological Archives Forum which is basically a comprehensive guide that is mapped to project stages and explains at each project stage what stakeholders are expected to deliver. It might include standards and guidance written by CIFA, like the creation, compilation, transfer and deposition of archaeological archives, or the standard and guidance for the collection, documentation, conservation and research of archaeological materials. More recently, the selection toolkit for archaeological archives and then, of course, the even more recent Digital Archives in Archaeology by Dig Ventures. Local deposition standards and guidelines are produced by museums and repositories, and they are the organisation's own standard requirements and guidelines for the compilation and transfer of archives. These should be made available to anyone planning an archaeological project in advance of the project start, and the document might be called a deposition policy or a deposition standard or guidelines. Deposition guidance should include guidance on project planning, archive compilation and archive transfer. So thanks very much for listening today. If you want to find any of this information in print or find further information, please take a look at the SMA guidance on care of archaeological collections, which you can find either on the SMA website or on the Collections Trust website.